Can you relay that story? How did we start that conversation? You were talking about uh, video games. You went into the Toys R Us. Oh, yes. Yeah, so video games suddenly took this big leap. We were in the Toys R Us. I don't remember how young you were. But there was a demo of some video game. And what did we have at home? We had like a 128. Is that what it's called? The Nintendo. The early Nintendo version. And you guys would play Simpsons World. And... Um, and we walked around the corner, and there's this demo of a new Sonic game, and it was incredible. It's just like three dimensional and really bright colors and really clear images. And like, that cannot be a video game. That is so amazing. Anything else to add about profound experiences? Yeah, I hated you kids playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> a waste of time. I did my darndest to stop you playing video games. Still, still feel that way? Hmm. <laughs> Get a job. <laughs> a job in video games? <laughs> Do you remember how you guys used to play? We'd t get floppy disks, we'd borrow floppy disks from the library, mm -hmm. and you'd play uh, McGee <laughs> goes to the farm, <laughs> and there'd be sort of one image, and McGee would go, hi. I'm McGee, and you could somehow make him walk over, and maybe you couldn't even make him walk over, maybe you just hit return a bunch of times, and he'd pick up a watermelon and put it down. <laughs> he'd have to go into another room. You wouldn't see him go into the room. He'd just be in the next room. <laughs> there were like six things you could do. <laughs> I guess it was, you'd click on it with a mouse, I guess. Those were the days. Those were the days. What I think is funny is how you all tell time with Oregon Trail. <laughs> like, everyone has a version of Oregon Trail they can relate to. <laughs> what generation you are what based on what Oregon Trail you Oregon played. Trail, exactly. Mm. Like, we were pretty much text based. Mm. <laughs> Your ox is dead. <laughs> so, Uncle Dan, Zach was one, and we moved to New York, and I didn't know anyone, and Uncle Dan gave me that early Nintendo set. And when Zach would take naps, I started playing um, Mario's Island, Yoshi's Island, or something. <laughs> you could go from one world to another and boop 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 boop. Dee 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 dee. Ding ding ding. <laughs> so I play that, and then I realized it was a huge colossal waste of time. That and the Simpsons game, whatever it was, Bart's Nightmare, I think it was called. And when you guys were old enough to lock I just hid the whole thing on a top shelf and somehow you knew it was there <laughs> and for years you kept somehow in your deep consciousness gravitating toward that bookshelf <laughs> knowing that there was something on the top that you couldn't even see and I think one day you climbed the bookshelves and got it off the top or something and that was the end that was the end of life as we knew it. <laughs> and the beginning of what? The beginning of many years of wasted time. <laughs> Loss of life experiences. Mm -hmm. No going outside and getting dirty and reading books all day. And getting excited to go to the library and bring your books home. We went to the library and we played McGee. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Yeah, the library had good games. We had uh, Dr. Brain, and that game, what was it? You were trying to build a race car? I forget how that worked. It was some kind of game where you would do stuff, like you do little math exercises in a factory, and then if you did your exercise right, you'd get a piece of the race car. I don't remember that. No. Maybe that was Zach's thing. So there were books, like one was called Grandpa and Me, and there were a bunch of, there were a bunch of Mercer Mayer books, 
and um, I don't remember how they work, but I think you clicked on different, th that's it, you clicked on different things, it would read you the text, which was really short, and then you could click on things in the, on the page, and cute things would happen, like a little puppy would come out from under a mushroom and kill something, or whatever. <laughs> And then really can, cute things would happen. <laughs> you can only click it once and it wouldn't happen again. And when you ran out of stuff to click, you'd click the arrow and you go to the next page. And um, there's another one. Yeah, and then there was the smelly mystery, which you guys must have watched a thousand times. Um, which were, really I didn't watch very much, but they had... Um, they had some detective who's trying to find something and his sidekick who would say yes chief inspector like Sean Connery so when I was in college I graduated in 1983 and I took my first computer course in 1983 <laughs> and I had never touched a computer I'd never seen a computer um, well, I guess I'd seen them in people's offices, but I had no idea how to use a computer, except for word processing. And I thought, I should really know about these things. And I took the course for three classes, and I dropped it, because it just seemed so advanced. And, and by the way, I have a Master's of Science <laughs> degree in engineering now, <laughs> so I did eventually get on that train. Um... So I, I used word processing programs, which I could go into the whole history, or history of typewriters. Word processing was this huge, huge bonus, this treasure of being able to correct your work before you printed it and have more than one copy of your work without using carbon paper. Uh, look it up. Wikipedia carbon paper. Um, so I, I had some word processing jobs, but on the campus, we didn't have printers. We didn't have PCs. They didn't really exist. They didn't exist. So if you wanted to actually print something, and um, I mean, I guess you, could, you had a typewriter, but if you wanted to print something from a word processor, you had to go to the computer center. And the computer center was one of those centers where, you know, big CRTs with the green type on them, right, against a black background. And you could get into different, like one word processing program. And the printers would come out with the striped paper that you had to decollate the edges. That's a real word <laughs> to pull off the sides. Um, yeah, or probably plain paper too. And while you were waiting for your paper to print, there was this game you could play online called Adventure. Well, there wasn't online. There was this game in the computer center, in the computers, called Adventure. And it was a text-based game. Um, and no, you said it was something else. It wasn't actually Adventure. It was called... No, it was Adventure. I mean, the, the full name is Colossal Cave Adventure, but it's Adventure. Oh. Yeah, so it was a thing that I used to play waiting for my papers to print. Um, and you know what adventure is. You the start the in fans a, at home you, don't know, though. Oh, they must know. They must know. You would start in a... It was all text, <clears throat> but it was all in your imagination. Because <clears throat> we had imaginations <laughs> in those days. Because we'd spent a lot of time outdoors when we were kids, and we read a lot of books, and we weren't distracted by... This. <laughs> Could you make that gesture again for us? All day long. <laughs> um, so you started in a field, and you could see a house in the distance, and you you basically had to figure out as you went along what the commands were. So S W E N for directions, and you'd end up at the front door of the house. And oh no, this is Zork. Zork. You're right. This yes, is Zork. Zork, not adventure. But similar, pretty much the same thing. And um, you, that's my phone. That's my phone. <laughs> um, you would you would do the text-based adventure, like you'd go into a room, and 
It would say you're you're in a kitchen and there's a half-eaten sandwich on the table. And that would be it. And to get anything done, you'd have to explore the room in text. So you'd say, um, look around. You'd say there's a half-eaten sandwich and the knife used to cut it. And you'd say, take knife. So now you'd have a knife. And so on. <laughs> then you never knew where you'd end up. You'd go east. Now you're in the living room, and it would turn out that you had to roll up a rug and go into a chute that took you into the dungeon, but you had to make sure that you had the lantern, which was upstairs above the kitchen, you know, you had to figure these things out. But you go through the cave, and you end up in this place, look around, where are you? You're in a maze of twisty passages all alike. And that was sort of the death knell. You know, if you could get out then, fine, but of course you wanted to explore, so you'd go forward to your maze of twisty passages all alike. And it took a long time to realize that sometimes it would say you're in a twisty maze of passages, or you're in a passages all alike maze. So there was actually a way to figure out where you were, if you had the time. And, uh, and I guess you found a map that I'd made. Right. I found a That's Zork a map of yours. I found a Zork map that I made over time. Because when I went to work as an engineer for a well-known computer manufacturer who was one of the leading creators of desktop equipment at the time, um, you could play Zork <laughs> online. <laughs> and as they said, how many people work at DEC? About a third of them. <laughs> so there was a lot of time online. And DEC, this was still before the internet, and DEC had DECnet, which was cool because, which was amazing, because um, even when I was studying engineering, getting my master's of science in engineering, there was no internet. There were, you'd have a computer lab, and the computers were connected, which was how people could pass around the cookie virus. Um, which was, you'd get, you'd be working with your C prompt and, uh, you know, trying to print your basic assignment in basic code, I mean, where you were typing up your Pascal and you had to run it and see if it worked. You had to compile it <clears throat> and then print it on the printer and decolate the edges. But now and then you'd get, you know, some conversation on your C prompt, like people could just kind of talk back and forth, even though they were in the next row. And then some, sometimes you'd see the word cookie, and you try to interact with whatever's on your screen, right? So it turned out the way to respond to cookie, the only response to cookie was cookie. And if you said cookie, you could get rid of the word cookie by having your entire screen covered with the word cookie. Cookie, 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 cookie. Thousands of cookies filling up your screen. And uh, and then you could get on with your life. But that was the only way to get out of the cookie virus. So it was very annoying. People would send it back and forth. It was a program someone had written, I should say, virus. Um, so that those 50 computers were connected. They were linked. And they were linked to the uh, the guy up at the front behind the booth who would give you your printed stuff. And then I went to DEC, and it was like this quantum leap forward because 100,000 people were employed by DEC, a third of them actually working. Wait, all we're over at 1% the world. battery, and we're about to lose this video. Okay, good. Quick final thoughts. <laughs> uh, hello out there. Bye, Ben's <laughs> Games. He's a great programmer, and they're really fun.